The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So everyone, take a deep breath. Praise the Lord. Again, inhale. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. One more time. Praise the Lord. This is a good day. You will be blessed tonight. Let us pray to our Lord. Heavenly Father, I love you and I praise you for your faithfulness. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth just like you want it. We ask you, do it through us. We confess Jesus as Lord. We have peace because all our needs are met by our Lord. Give us revelation knowledge. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. I have three words for you to write down. I have them here on the screen. First word, knowledge. Second word, understanding. Third word, wisdom. These three words are the three most important admonitions in the Bible. You are students of the Bible, so you've read these three words. Solomon says, pursue knowledge, get understanding, seek wisdom. These three are necessary, but the most important is wisdom. So let me explain what they are. Do not forget this. Knowledge. Right next to that word, information. Knowledge. Information. Next to the word understanding, write the word comprehension. Comprehension. Next to the word wisdom, Write the word application. Application. There you have the admonition in scriptures. Knowledge is information. Understanding is comprehension. And wisdom is application. If you have information but you don't have comprehension, you cannot have application. You can have knowledge and not have wisdom. You don't have to apply it. And many of you have that problem. You got good teaching for many years, but you don't apply it. No wisdom. The Bible says wisdom is supreme. You have learned much. You've gotten information. The teachers have given you information. But I am not impressed. Because I am praying that you will have wisdom. Jesus preached the kingdom for three and a half years. And every time he preached, he would say these words. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? Do not just get knowledge. Understand it. Then he said, He who hears my words and does them. Application. Then happy is he. Jesus, before he was Jesus, was called the Word. 
The word is knowledge. But when God needed to save us, he was changed from being the word to wisdom. The scriptures say, Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom. Jesus is God applied. God loves us. That's knowledge. He sent his only son. That's wisdom. Application. So my prayer for you is that you will have wisdom. Apply what you hear. In my teachings, I know I have said many difficult things. And I know it has been difficult for you. That's my intention. So if you are disturbed, that's wonderful. If you are confused, beautiful. Because that is why I'm here. You are only growing when you learn something new. And you did not come here to learn what you know. So I have to be hard on you. I have to challenge your theology. And that is good. So now, tonight, well, I'll be nice to you. <laughs> so let's do this. Get your Bible. And I'm going to validate everything I've said. And you will have to have wisdom. We will use the Bible. And I'm going to show you everything in the Bible that we've talked about. Please go to Luke chapter 4. And the reason I want you to have your Bible is so you can underline these scriptures in your Bible. I'm going to put them on the screen for you, but I want you to be able to see them right there in your own Bible. That's your constitution, the kingdom. I want to speak on the subject, the purpose of Jesus the kingdom. The purpose of Jesus. The kingdom. Luke chapter 4. Take your pen and please underline verse 42. Let us read what it says. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. What he said, please underline this. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. I must preach the kingdom of God. I must preach the kingdom of God to other towns also. Get ready. Because that is why I was sent. For that is why... I was sent. My principal purpose was not to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, feed the 5,000, go to Calvary, rise from the dead. These were not my principal focus. These were all necessary for me to accomplish my main goal. What the church has done, the church has made the means the end. Jesus said, the reason why I came is to preach the kingdom, to establish the kingdom. Hallelujah. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. You must keep your Bible close there because I must prove to you from the Bible everything about the kingdom. And I want you to look these scriptures up yourself. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus was baptized by John. And then he went into the desert to be tested by the devil. He passed his tests to begin his ministry. His father was pleased. And now, he was 30 years old. 
which was the age to become a rabbi. Please write that down. Very important. A man could only be a rabbi when he was 30 years old. So in order to be heard, he had to be respected. That's why he waited until he was 30 years old, so he could be heard by the people in his culture. He's 30 years old. He's passed his test. He's full of the Holy Ghost. He comes out of the desert, and he's ready to begin his ministry to save the world. His first public statement is found in verse 17, Matthew chapter 4. Let us read it together. Everyone, and that means every pastor, also read this. His first public statement. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Quote, repent. Interesting. The first word of Jesus in his ministry is repent. Write the word repent down, please. This must be an important word because it's the first word Jesus spoke. What does the word repent mean? Write it down. I will tell you. The word repent does not mean to come forward to the altar and bring up your past. But that's what we've been taught. That's religion. That's not the word Jesus used. So a preacher preaches, and he preaches about hell. Jesus did not preach much about hell. We preach about hell, not Jesus. He preached kingdom. So a preacher preaches about hell. He preaches about sin. Jesus did not preach much about sin. We preach about sin. He preached about the kingdom of God. Jesus talked much about sin to religious people. <laughs> he told the Pharisees, you will die in your sin. He told the Pharisees, woe to you. If I did not come, you would be without your sins. But because I have come, you have your sins. Because you don't believe in me. But he said to the prostitute, I love you. Problem. Don't tell the sinners about their sins. They know they are sinners. You must stop sinning. Stop sinning. You know better. Repent. Repent does not mean to come forward and bring up your past. Oh, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I did all these things, all these things I did. Oh, Listen, that is not repent. That's remorse. Remorse is dangerous because remorse is psychological. When you come to the altar and you bring up your past, and you feel bad about your past, and then you ask God to forgive you, and you believe he forgives you, and there's this relief. <sighs> See? Now that is the problem. So now you feel better. Ah, <sighs> I feel better. That's the problem. Now you can sin again. That is why you keep sinning. I'm talking to you. Yes, you and you, pastors, ministers, you still sin. And you ask God to forgive you. And you sin again. And you ask for forgiveness. And you sin again. And you don't change. You just feel better. So you can do it again. This is not repent. Many of you got secret sins. Pastors, 
secret sins. If I could see into your mind, you would be ashamed. Maybe I can. Jesus said, repent. What does the word repent mean? It means change your mind. Please write it down. Repent. It means change your thinking. Repent. It means change the way you've been conditioned to think. Repent. It means to think in the opposite. First word in his public ministry, change of thinking. Why? Because Jesus knew, as a man thinks, that is the man. You are not what you believe. You are what you think. Please write that down. For example, you believe in tithing. <laughs> you do not tithe. You don't believe and think the same thing. You will not tithe until you think tithing. It becomes a way of life. You tithe. You are not tithers. There's a difference. You believe in prayer. You do not pray. Ah, see? You are guilty. Pastors do not pray. They believe in prayer, but they do not pray. You are not what you believe. You are what you think. So Jesus says to you, repent. Change your mind. Think prayer, and you will be prayer. You will not live without it. The kingdom of God demands a new thinking. Now, the Lord told me to do something, and so I need to pause and teach you about tithing for 10 minutes, okay? The reason why God created tithing, tithing has nothing to do with giving God money. Can I say it again? Tithing has nothing to do with giving God money. God doesn't need nothing from you. You couldn't even give God nothing. Everything on earth already belongs to God. He doesn't need anything from us. So when God sets something up, it's not because he needs it. Tithing and offerings is God's management training program for mankind. This is important. God doesn't need a penny from us, and yet he tells us 10% of everything is mine. We only think of money, and that's our problem. If you got 10 pairs of shoes, one of them isn't yours. If you get 10 dresses or 10 suits, one of them is not yours. If you bought 10 oranges, one of them is not yours. You've got 24 hours in a day. Two hours and 40 minutes don't belong to you. I ain't got time to pray. What are you talking about? You've got two hours and 40 minutes that don't belong to you. You are a thief every day when you don't use those two hours and 40 minutes for God's purposes. You are a thief, a tired thief, sleeping on God's time. You spend two hours, four hours, eight hours watching James Bond movies or cable TV and don't give God his two hours and 40 minutes that belong to him. 10%. You can't even manage two hours and 40 minutes. You're trying to get money. Money ain't your problem. Management is your problem. 
God could at any time command you to give the suit away in your closet. One of them is not yours. So tithing and offerings ain't about money. It's about management. Say management. Management. Can you consistently, God says, put aside 10% of everything for my purposes? That's tithing. Consistently putting aside 10% of everything for the purposes of God. Consistently. 10% is the tithe. Tithe is another word for tax. When you get your paycheck, there's a portion of it that you tear off. It's called the pay stub. Have you ever read the information on your pay stub? On it, it lists a number of different taxes that are deducted out of your check, like federal tax and Social Security. The government in your country says you have to pay taxes on your income. Am I right? All right. In God's country, his government also requires that you pay taxes. And God has never raised taxes. It has always been 10%. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me help you understand how this works. 100% of everything belongs to God. What did I say? 100% of everything belongs to God. Say it again. 100% of everything belongs to God. So God blesses you with a $1,000 paycheck. How much of that belongs to God? 1000 Good. How much does God say to put aside for his work? 10%. How much is left? 90%. You're smart. How much of it belongs to God? All of it. You're getting it. So why then, if God owns all of the thousand dollars, would want you to put aside 10% if all of it belongs to him? Why would he do that? Because it's not about the money. It's about your ability to put it aside. Your will, your control, your discipline to put it aside. He's after your discipline. If you can manage the 10% properly, then he is happy to trust you with the 90% that's left. But because you've been unfaithful in the 10%, you keep losing the 90, and so you end up with no percent. That's why you're broke. So you tell God, I can't pay tithes this week. Things are tough. We are in crisis right now, God. I mean, you got to figure this out. Things are too rough to pay tithes. God is saying, what are you talking about? Your salvation is in the tithe. Let me take you one step further. This is what tithing does to you. Number one, accountability. Write it down. Now, each one of these words is management. If you keep paying your tithes and giving your offering, you automatically first become accountable. Number two, discipline. Write it down. For you to put aside that aside every single time, that takes control. Number three, honesty. For you to be a tither, no one is watching except God, and He knows if you paid it or not. You can lie to everybody else. But God knows if you paid 10%. That means it makes you honest. And managers 
must be honest. What's the fourth word? Diligence. Write it down. Diligence means you work at it constantly to make sure you don't steal that 10%. That's what managers are supposed to do. What's the next word? Number five, faithfulness. Oh my God. That's what's wrong with managers. They are unfaithful. And it takes faithfulness to tithe. What's the last one? Number six, trustworthiness. Write it down. For you to manage a tithe, God's got to trust you every time. I just gave you the characteristics of a manager. They are accountable. They are honest. They are disciplined. They are diligent. They are faithful. They are trustworthy. One day, Jesus showed top-class management. One time he had 5,000 people in a field, and they were all hungry. And they say, plus women and children, so they must have had about 12,000. And he's about to distribute some resources to them. Watch Jesus at work. This is in Mark 6, verse 40. And go there with me. I don't have these scriptures for you on the screen, but look in your Bible. Mark 6, 40. Jesus directed to have all the people sit down. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. That's verse 40. That's administration, organization. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes. That's the resources. Looking up to the one who owns them, he gave thanks. He thanked the owner for letting him use them. That's appreciation. That means it doesn't belong to you. It's someone else's property. Then he broke it and gave them to his disciples, and they gave it to the people. That's delegation. That's management. He also divided the two fishes among them all, and they all ate as much as they wanted, and all were satisfied. That's customer service. <laughs> Praise God for good customer service. All were satisfied. Now watch his management kick in. It says, And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. He told them to pick up every crumb. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to imagine this. Twelve thousand people in an open field breaking bread and pieces of fish. How in the world are you going to find pieces of breadcrumbs and pieces of fish and bone and stuff in the grass? He said to them, pick up every crumb so that nothing is wasted. In the book of John, he actually says that. He says, pick up every crumb and bring it to me. I don't want to waste nothing. This country is built on a culture of waste. And it is in the church. Who goes directly to the buffet after service? You. And what do you do at that buffet? You know the plate is too small for what you want to do. You pile it up and you sit at the table, and then you leave half of it on the plate. You are a bad manager. And God, he's taking notes. John wastes food. Poor manager. This ain't funny. Jesus made them pick up the crumbs. 
It was not the crumbs that were important. It was the lesson he was teaching. You don't waste the crumbs. That's kingdom thinking. Everybody say repent. I repent. I change my thinking. Amen. That's why Jesus had to say, repent. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. This is his first public statement in ministry. Matthew 4, 17. Repent. Change your mind. Change your thinking. Because the kingdom of heaven has arrived. First message. First statement. He declares his mission statement. Everything Jesus came to do is in this one sentence. Every effective organization must define its mission statement. It must define its vision statement. So here is God in the flesh announcing to the world his mission statement, his vision statement. One sentence, repent, change your mind, change your thinking, because the kingdom of heaven has arrived. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's why he came, not to build a religion. What have we done? We've made the kingdom into a religion, and we call it Christianity, and we defend it. We protect it. We are afraid of the Muslims, afraid of the Buddhists, afraid of the Spiritists, afraid of the Hindus. We protect our religion. We are just another religion. What a tragedy. I am not a religious woman. I used to be religious. Hmm. It almost killed me. I used to be a Christian. Repent. Change your mind. I'm talking to you, the church. Repent. Jesus told the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, religious leaders, you are them. Repent. Change the way you think. That's why I'm here. To help you repent. The kingdom of God. What is the kingdom? You want to know? Do you want to know? Turn to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 9, verse 6. What of your favorite scriptures that you do not know? This scripture is about the coming of Jesus. For unto us a child is born and a son is given. We like that part. We preach about that part. We know that part. For unto us a child is born. And a son is given. Hallelujah. We preach that. But we miss the point. The point is not that the child is born and the son is given. The point is why was he given? Why was he born? It's in the next statement. Government. Government. Read it. Government. That's the kingdom. He came to bring a government, dominion, authority, leadership, glory, honor, power, dominion, government. He came to restore what you lost. Government, leadership, authority, dominion, 
glory, honor, power, dominion, government. Why don't we read the scriptures? Because we've made our religion more important than the scriptures. Let's keep reading. And the government, not a government, but the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Abba. Abba. He is our source. He is called Son because he came from the Father. But he's also called Father because he and the Father are the same. Read. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory a Dios. Do you understand? Do you understand this statement? No. Read it again. He brings a government, a kingdom, a dominion, authority. And his government shall keep increasing, growing and growing and growing and growing, no end, and growing and growing and growing and growing until it takes over the whole nation where you live. I declare that this church does not exist to go to heaven. This church, this body, the body of Christ, exists to take over. Of the increase of his government, and it's growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, increasing, increasing, it's increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing, no end. If you obey God, then people will say, who do you think you are? You want to take over all of the city? All of the country? Yes. And growing and growing and growing and growing and increasing and increasing and increasing and increase. No end. We don't read the scriptures. Jesus came with a government. He was carrying it on his shoulders. When you have something on your shoulders, it means you are carrying it for somebody. He comes with a government. The kingdom, the power, the dominion, the glory, the honor, the power, the dominion, the government. And he brings it to the children who lost it. He says, here, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. You are a governor. Come on, say it out loud. I am a governor. Sit up straight, you governor. Say it again. I am a governor. I work for the government. Read. Of the increase of his government and peace, 
There will be no end. Next verse. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. God says, I will personally establish this kingdom. What is a kingdom? I will define it for you. Write the word dominion down. The word dominion lays the foundation for the kingdom concept as it relates to God's purpose and plan for the human species. The word dominion, menlaka, is the same Hebrew word that turns out to be the same word that's translated in English as kingdom. So the words dominion and kingdom are really the same. Notice the dom in both words. Dominion and kingdom. The word dominion in Genesis 1.26, here's what it means in Hebrew. Please write. Everybody write this down. This is important for you to write. It's about you. He said, let them have dominion. He was talking to you. The king was assigning dominion to his children. So let's find out what dominion is. He was giving this to you. What was he giving you? The word dominion, the Hebrew word, melakak, here's what it means. Number one, to govern. Number two, to rule. Number three, to control. Number four, to manage. Manage the earth for me. That's administration. Number five, to master. Number six, to lead. Interesting. Kingdom. And the last one, to be king. I will read them again. Why did God create you? To dominate. To have dominion means to govern, to rule, to control, to master, to manage, to lead, to be king. That's you. That's why God created you. This is why you must repent. This is why the first word of Jesus is repent. Because you've been a slave for 6,000 years. So your mentality is damaged. You think like a prodigal son. You are a governor. You are a ruler. You are a master. You are a leader. But look at you. You are afraid. Depressed. Frustrated. Poor. So Jesus said, repent. Why? Porque the kingdom has arrived. Change your mind. You are now governors again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sit up straight. Come on, sit up like a governor. Your Excellency. <laughs> your Excellency. Governor. Let them have dominion. Let us make man in our own nature. What is God's nature? Not poverty. Not fear. Not depression. Not oppression. But power. Glory. Honor. 
dominion, love, righteousness, holiness, faith, power, dominion, glory, honor. Let us make man in that nature. You are powerful. Say that out loud. I am powerful. Come on, say it. I am powerful. Satan is afraid of me today. Wisdom is coming to me today. <laughs> the devil's afraid of you. You can stop the devil. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why Jesus said, I've given you authority. Why are you afraid? I've given you authority to stomp unto serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. You have authority. Stomp the devil. <laughs> Thy kingdom come. <laughs> this is the good news. This is the gospel. That's why it's called good news. You've gotten your power back. This is what the sinner is looking for. Most of you came to Jesus for fire insurance, not for kingdom. That's why you must repent. That's why you cannot reach the world. That's why your church cannot grow. People are not looking for fire insurance. They are looking for power. That's why they follow Jesus, you know. He promised them power, dominion, glory, honor, power, dominion. They said, we want that. Do you know what a sinner hates? He doesn't control his life. Alcohol controls him. Drugs control him. Sex controls him. Circumstances control him. Depression controls him. Oppression controls him. Money controls him. He hates it. He's a victim. And Jesus comes and says, you can have dominion and power and glory and honor over all the earth. God told Adam, he says, Adam, have dominion over the fish, over the birds, the cattle, the plants, the trees, and all the earth. Today, men are controlled. Men are controlled by plants. A leaf from Colombia controls your community. A leaf from Cuba controls your community. A grape, a fruit controls your community. A fruit controls a man. A leaf controls a man. I know you don't smoke marijuana. I know you don't smoke cigars or cigarettes. I know you don't drink alcohol. You don't get drunk on wine. You are religious people. You are holy people. I don't believe you. You are still controlled by a plant. <laughs> gotcha. It's in your pocket or your purse. You love this plant, don't you? Spirit-filled people of God love this plant. Oh, Professor Vanessa, I don't love that plant. Oh, yes, you do. It controls you. You work for it. It doesn't work for you. Sunday morning, the pastor says, there's a prayer meeting tomorrow. 
7 p.m. Monday morning, it begins to rain, heavy rain. You get up, put your clothes on. I've got to get to work. You hurry up, catch the bus. You run in the rain. You go to work. You come home. Prayer meeting is at 7 o'clock. I can't go. It's raining. <laughs> gotcha. Have dominion. You go to work because you work for the tree. It dominates you. But you won't go to God. You don't go to the prayer meeting. You love money more than God. Everybody say repent. Repent means what? Change your thinking. Repent. 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 You are a pastor. You watch television. But you won't pray. Repent. You go to football games. Soccer. But you don't read the Bible. Repent. Thy kingdom come. Everybody say it with me. Thy kingdom come. Say it again. Thy kingdom come. The kingdom is a government. What is a government? I want to read some scriptures for you about the kingdom. And I will tell you what a government is. And this will change your thinking forever. You will no longer be poor. You will no longer be sick. You will no longer be depressed. You will be a powerful man or a powerful woman. The entire Bible is about the kingdom. It's not about a religion. It's about a government. It's about dominion over the earth. Okay, get your Bibles. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. What did John the Baptist preach? It's right here. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What did he preach? Quote, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. What did John preach? The kingdom of God. What did John preach? The kingdom of God. Mark chapter 1. Now listen, you are in school tonight. This is Bible school. Mark Chapter 1, verse 14. Every pastor, go to Mark 1, verse 14. What did Jesus preach? After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What is the good news of God? What is the good news of God? Look at the verse. What is the good news of God? It's not a religion. He said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is here. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 10. Quickly, Underline every verse. Matthew 10, verse 6. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. Now notice, Jesus is sending them out two by two into the ministry. But he does not trust them. He does not trust them to create their own message. And that's our problem. We are preaching healing. 
We preach faith. We preach Holy Spirit. We preach prosperity. We preach deliverance. We even preach born again. Jesus says, when you go, this is what you must preach and don't change it. Read it. When you go, preach this message. What has the church been preaching? You don't know the kingdom. So what have you been preaching all these years? He said, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Now, why did he say the kingdom is near? Because remember, the only thing that man is missing is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was living in Jesus, and he's near them. But the Holy Spirit cannot go in them yet because they are not holy. So he tells everybody, the kingdom is near. It's among them, and one day it shall be in them. Good news, power, dominion, glory, honor, dominion is near you. It shall be in you. That's the good news. Okay, go with me to Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is, has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Why? John the Baptist is a strange prophet. Listen to me carefully. Revelation is coming. John is a New Testament prophet with one foot in the Old Testament. John never receives the Holy Spirit. So John is introduced in Malachi, last three verses, and he shows up in Matthew chapter 1. So Jesus said, there is no greater prophet than John. Why? Isaiah... Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi. All of them spoke about Christ's coming. They prophesied about Christ's coming. They said the Messiah was coming. For hundreds of years, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. But John is the only prophet who prophesied he's coming. And then he saw him. The greatest prophet. And yet Jesus said, even though he's the greatest prophet, he is not as great as the little child who receives the Holy Spirit. You have what Daniel didn't have. I'm ashamed of you. You have what Joshua didn't have. And you are depressed. You have what Ezekiel didn't have. And you are afraid. I'm ashamed of you. You have what Moses never had. And you are afraid of life. You have what Samson never had. And you are so weak. Why? You are religious. In the Old Testament, every prophet, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They prophesied. And then he left. He could not enter them. But you, he cleansed you. He shed his blood for you. He made you holy. And then he said, receive power, glory, 
honor, dominion, love, righteousness, power, glory. Just lift your hands. Go ahead. Speak to your problems. Tell your mountains to go to the sea. Speak now. Take authority. You have the kingdom within you. Take authority. This isn't religion. It's the kingdom. If you are sick, tell that disease to go. Body healed. Hallelujah. If you are poor, demand your wealth to come. Finances healed. In the name of Jesus. If you are weak, say, I am strong. Take authority. Cast out demons from your neighborhood now. Tell them to go. Take authority. Take authority over your circumstances. Take authority over your problems. You are not weak. You are strong. You are not afraid. You are confident. A new day has come. Hallelujah. This is a church of power. A church of confidence. A church of dominion. Take authority. <laughs> Abba. 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 Mi Abba. Say, Mi Abba. Tell him. My Abba. My source. My source. The kingdom of God is here. The government of God is here. Hallelujah. This is a historic day because God's people are repenting. Okay, let's look at the next verse. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Jesus continues to speak about John. He says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. Because, verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. All the law and prophets prophesied up until John. <laughs> they never saw the kingdom. They never experienced the full kingdom. But when John arrived, six months later, the kingdom arrived. Jesus was six months younger than John. So when John was born from Elizabeth, then Mary was favored and Jesus was born. So Jesus said, from John until himself, the kingdom began to take over. He said, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom began to violently advance. When John announced me, the yeast was put in the dough. This is the kingdom. It is advancing by force. Nothing can stop it. It's powerful. The church looks weak because it's a religion. But Jesus said, the kingdom is violent. The church is afraid. Afraid of the world. 
I don't want to be with them because they smoke cigarettes. Well, I don't want to be with them because they drink alcohol. I don't want to go there. They are prostitutes there. They are stronger than me. I might become a prostitute. I can't go into politics. They are dirty. I might become corrupt. Politics are stronger than the kingdom. I cannot go into sports. I might become like the sports people. Sports is stronger than the kingdom. Let us stay by ourselves. Let us just be Christians. Let us hide out in a building. We call it church. Don't go out. We are afraid of them. They may take our power. They are advancing against us. What is this? What have you done to his kingdom? The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. And forceful men take hold of it. What does that mean? It means the kingdom of God is growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And when you understand it, you abandon everything else to understand it, to go after it, to operate it, to execute it, to make it happen on earth. You're forceful. You take over sports. You take over entertainment. You take over politics. You take over education. You take over the community. You take over the children. You take over the youth. You Take over the whole world. Don't take cover. Take over. <laughs> Glory adios. Glory adios. Jesus was so confident of the power of his kingdom. He told 11 men, go into all the world and take it. That's power. That's the power you have. But it's buried under religion. But today, I declare a resurrection. The kingdom is in you. Say it. The kingdom is in me. Hallelujah. I don't think you got it. <laughs> the kingdom is within you. It's in you. Say it again. The kingdom is in me. What is a kingdom? I want to close with this list. A kingdom has a king. Please write these down. A kingdom as territory, a domain. It has a constitution. The Bible is the constitution of our kingdom. A kingdom has an army. Oh dear, I must correct something here. The army is the angels. Every kingdom has an army. Let me ask you a question. Does America have an army? Yes. Are you in it? No. You are citizens. Citizens do not fight. Religion says, we are the army. God says, no. You don't fight against flesh and blood. Daniel was a citizen. And Daniel said to the government, I need something. 
and the government sent it with the army. Daniel never fought. He just sat and he prayed. We do not fight. We just make requests. And the angels were fighting. And Daniel just waited. Stop fighting. Pray. <laughs> and relax. Religious people fight. Kingdom people pray. Every kingdom has an army. Do you remember Jesus? Jesus was in the courtroom. Two kingdoms. Pilate. Jesus. Pilate says, you a king? And Jesus says, you say so. You are correct. Pilate says, in my kingdom, I can crucify you or give you your life. I have the power to give you life or take it from you. Jesus was very quiet. All night, he didn't say a word. But when Pilate said that, he had to say something because it was a kingdom challenge. So Jesus spoke. He said, Pilate, I have an army too. <laughs> and he did not refer to his disciples because they are citizens. He says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And even now, if I give the commands, legions of angels will come here right now and deliver me out of your hands. The army, the army, the army. The Constitution says, your Constitution it says, the government has given his angels commands concerning you to guard you and to protect you and to secure you. So why do you worry? Because you are religious. Tonight, I invite you, come to the kingdom. It's a good life. It's abundant life. No worries. No stress. And an army that takes care of you. Elijah. Sitting on the porch. In a rocking chair. There's an army coming. He could see them in the distance. Thousands of soldiers coming to kill him. And Elijah relaxed, rocking in the chair. And his servant says, Master, look, the army is coming to kill us. And there's Elijah, rocking in the chair. And the servant says, Master, don't you see them coming? Yep. But master, we are going to die. Elijah says, government, open his eyes. And he looked and he saw thousands of angels. Thousands of angels. Kingdom. <laughs> Reno. Kingdom, Reno. Listen to me. You are not alone. You are not alone. You are not alone. There are angels everywhere. The angels are everywhere. Angels are everywhere. You are safe. You are safe 
My son, you are safe. You are protected. That's the kingdom. <laughs> praise God. Lift your hands. Just praise the king. Hallelujah. We worship you. We glorify you. We thank you. We worship you. The king of kings. King of kings. The king is to be worshipped. Hallelujah. This is the church. This is not a religion. It's a government. You are not the army. You are the citizens. Glory to God. Glory adios. Every government has security systems. What did I just say? Every government has security systems. Your security is right behind you now. One of them is called goodness, and the other is mercy. They follow me. Hello, goodness. Hello, mercy. They follow me all the days of my life. So be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. No more fear. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You are a son of God. A kingdom has laws. Now, I have a longer list than this, but I wanted to show you these tonight. I don't have time to go through all of them. But a kingdom has laws, and a kingdom has rights and privileges. Listen carefully. Jesus said, you are ambassadors. That is not a religious position. That's a political appointment. Why did Jesus not call you a political representative, a congressman? Because a congressman gets his power from the people. You vote for congressmen. Why didn't he call you a senator? That's a political voting program. The Constitution says you are an ambassador of Christ and his kingdom. Why? Because an ambassador is personally appointed by the king. Come on, sit up straight. You are an ambassador. You are an ambassador. Let me help you understand. The president of America is solely responsible to appoint ambassadors. Congress does not appoint ambassadors. The Senate does not appoint ambassadors. The president chooses whoever he wants to be ambassadors, and no one can disagree. That's the power of your constitution. In this constitution is the exact same policy. Jesus himself, the king, made you an ambassador. That's why the king says, you did not choose me. I chose you. Listen. Therefore, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It's too late. Why did he choose ambassador? Because when a president or a king appoints an ambassador, they no longer are a private citizen. Listen carefully. They are a citizen, but they are no longer private. Not private. They are still a citizen, but an ambassador is not a private citizen. He becomes the property of the government. So if the president of America came to you and said, I have 
appointed you now to be the ambassador to Peru to represent the government of America. Then the moment he says that, all of your bills become the government's responsibility. That's why ambassadors have no bills. The government provides a house for them, it buys a car for them, food for them, clothing for them, it pays the light bill, water bill, phone bill, it pays for their children's tuition, it pays for their sports, it pays for everything. It gives them a chauffeur, it gives them security guards, they think about nothing except the government's interests. So the king is speaking today. And the king says, today you are ambassadors. Therefore, do not worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, where you will live, Seek first the kingdom's interests, and everything is paid for. Hallelujah.